I appreciate your prayers. I apologize for being sick last week. I was a very sick puppy, and so I'm feeling much better today. And in our, my prayer time, I'll pray for all those who are sick. I know there's many more. Uh, how many of you watched the inauguration this week? I have a trivia question for you. Um, there were more people who prayed three invocations, three benedictions than ever in history. And the benediction, uh, Pastor Samuel Rodriguez, the first Hispanic to ever uh, do part of the benediction, uh, and Franklin Graham. Can anyone tell me, okay, uh, Samuel Rodriguez read from the um, Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 from a modern Bible translation. Franklin Graham read from 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, in his part of the benediction, can, in another Bible translation, modern translation, can anyone tell me the Bible translation that Rodriguez used for the Beatitudes, Matthew 5? I thought it was maybe the New Living. Very good, Jim. I, I, I guessed it was the New Living, and uh, that's exactly right. Uh, so a little bit paraphrastic, which is fine. It's a good translation. And what translation 1 Timothy Chapter 2, the first verses, did Franklin Graham read from? I thought New King James. Not the New King James. New American Not the New American Standard. The NIV. Not the NIV. I'm going to guess No, no, I no. Sorry, e, ES, ESV, the English Standard Version, the ESV. So, uh, but uh, it's my job to, to recognize these sorts of things, and so I, I knew what they were, but uh, I just wanted to see if you're, how on your toes uh, you are. But uh, anyway, just a little bit of trivia. In my sermon two weeks ago, I took a time out uh, from our series in the book of Revelation to talk about how and why most of us here at Lafayette Bible Chapel interpret the book of Revelation as prophecy of the future. And today I want us to take another time out for two Sundays uh, so we can study one of the Bible's most amazing, challenging, and encouraging truths, the rapture. question is, what is the rapture? And here is a definition I'll give you. The rapture is that great future event when Jesus Christ personally returns in the sky to resurrect Christians who've died and translate us living believers to heaven, giving us new resurrection bodies so that we will all be with the Lord forever. The next question, of course, is why is the rapture so important? Two reasons. Because if you've lost a loved one who is a believer in death, then you will meet that family member or friend in the air when Jesus returns. It'll be a reunion in the sky, not just with Jesus, but with those we love who have died in the Lord. And the rapture is important because the New Testament clearly teaches that Christ could come at any moment. That means that the rapture is a Bible event you and I, as Christians, could experience today. Knowing Christ could return today, tomorrow, or any day, ought to affect how we live, act, and talk every moment. A servant girl worked for a wealthy family and lived in their mansion. The owners went away on a long trip, but they did not tell her when they would return. One day, a visitor noticed that this girl had gone to all kinds of trouble to set the table for tea. The visitor asked the servant girl, are your master and mistress coming home today? The girl replied, I don't know if they'll come home today or not, but I want to please them. So I always have everything ready each day in case they come home. What a lesson for us as Christians. Do we have everything ready in our lives each day, each hour for Christ's return? Now, all of us Christians who believe the Bible believe in the rapture. But what we disagree on is when the rapture will occur. And so I'm giving you another of my charts here to show you the three main views of when the rapture will occur. And pre-tribulation rapture is that it will occur hours, days, weeks, possibly months before the start of the seven years of tribulation. The mid-tribulation rapture believes that 
it will occur, this coming of Christ in the sky to get us either right before or sometime in this area toward the middle of the tribulation. Post-tribulation rapture, that the rapture occurs at the end of the tribulation, but simultaneous with Christ's second coming. Now, there's other views that I'm not giving you. My favorite of the minor views is called the partial rapture. And in the partial rapture, only the spiritual Christians go. So if you're out of fellowship with God on the day of the rapture, tough kasabis, you get left behind. And so what I love about that view is that anyone who holds it, they believe that they're going to go. So a little, little bit of presumption there. The question uh, is important in our study of Revelation because in February, when we resume our study in Revelation chapter 6, we're going to see that after the start of that seven years of tribulation described in Revelation 6, we have to decide, are we going to live as Christians through any of the tribulation? Are we going to live through part of the tribulation? Are we going to live through all of the tri tribulation? And that's what these three positions basically tell us. Now, I and most of us here this morning in our church believe in this pre-tribulation rapture that Christ will return before the start. So that means if this is true and I think it is, that we won't live through any of that seven years of tribulation on earth. Now, honestly, many godly Christians disagree with us, with our church on this position. And with each passing year, more and more professing Christians, churches, seminaries, Christian colleges believe in this position, the post-trib rapture. Um, so are we pre-tribbers right or wrong? You say pre-tribber in about the same tone you would say Star Trekker. Um, now, the sad thing is that we in this pre-trib position are often blamed with all kinds of evils in Christendom. And I don't think that's fair, but that's what happens. And so, but this question of which of these is true is not settled by popularity contests, by opinion polls, by how many people hold to it. Um, it's what does God's Word teach? And I believe that our church is on good biblical ground to hold to this first position, the pre-tribulation rapture, that Christ will return before the beginning of that seven years of tribulation. So my task today and next week is for us to first talk about what the rapture is, see it biblically, and then focus on why we believe that the Lord will return before the beginning of the tribulation. So it's a big task, and uh, I'm doing a lot of study for this, so uh, stay with me on it. So let's begin with prayer and commit this and other things to the Lord. Would you j join me in prayer? Father, I thank you for your word, and I pray for a special anointing, if I may, of your spirit as we study the rapture today and next week. Lord, help me to be gracious uh, to those that we would disagree with. Help me to be uh, accurate biblically. And so I pray that we would be encouraged by this great teaching of Scripture. Father, I pray for our new president, for his cabinet, for all the new leaders from Washington to our local level of government, that you would give them wisdom and guidance to rule this nation in a way that would be consistent with biblical values and for that would enable us to have the freedoms to proclaim the gospel and continue to serve you. Lord, I pray for the many in our church and beyond who have illnesses, that you would be gracious to raise them up from their illnesses and to have them to their well again. I pray for those who are grieving, Lord, especially would pray uh, this week for, uh, in this coming week, Lord, for Brother Everett and his children, for their families, uh, as we think a year ago, that our dear Pat went to be with you. And Lord, this just makes the rapture so much more wonderful to know that when you call us into the sky, that Pat will be there with Jesus, and as well as our moms and dads and grandparents and all those we've ever lost in the Lord. And so, Lord, help us to uh, look forward to that day even more. But I just pray for the grief that I know that the Everett, Everett's family is still going through. And finally, Lord, I would pray today, Sanctity of Life Sunday, that you would work a miracle in our country to, that new laws could be enacted that could save babies. Lord, I pray that um, 
this Holocaust would stop. I pray that we would do our part, whether it is to pray or to give or to get involved as uh, Debbie is leading us uh, in this effort here at our church. Lord, so that there could be ministry to moms who are pregnant and to dads, uh, to these families that are struggling with this terrible decision. Lord, so I pray that great inroads would be made through abortion counselors, uh, through the sidewalk, uh, those who pray, who do whatever, Lord. So I pray that uh, you would work a miracle in our land uh, to bring about the protection of life and the saving of many, many babies. And so, Lord, we commit this message now to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. There are three main passages in the New Testament about the rapture, and I'm giving them to you here. John 14, the first verses, 1 Thessalonians 4, the last verses of that chapter, and 1 Corinthians 15, the last verses of that chapter. And we'll look at each of these in turn. Now, the first promise of the rapture in the Bible, it was spoken by Jesus himself in his upper room discourse on the night before he was crucified. Let's look at it. John 14, beginning in verse 1. Jesus said, Your heart must not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Very interesting. That equates the Father and the Son as God. Verse 2, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If not, I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Now, right before John 14, uh, when Jesus said these words, he had just told his 12 disciples that they would all betray him, deny him, or desert him before his crucifixion. Now, they denied that. And of course, in just a few hours, Judas had betrayed him. Peter had denied him, and the other ten had deserted him. So these men were deeply troubled, and Jesus' words in these verses would have been great comfort to his disciples in that critical hour. But for the last 2,000 years, Jesus' words here have been a comfort and a consolation to millions of believers. Now, these Dwelling places that Jesus promised. In Greek, that's rooms or abodes. It doesn't sound like it's very big. It's the Latin Vulgate in Latin that gave us the word mansionis that found its way into the King James Version in the famous phrase, in my father's house are many mansions. But uh, probably not, we're not looking at something the size of Versailles. We're some, probably something a little bit smaller. Um, and many people feel that the, this... Uh, the new Jerusalem in the future is what Jesus went away to build and prepare for us. Now, I often read these verses at funerals. And in context, that's really not what Jesus was talking about. I think it's okay to use these verses to comfort anyone who has lost someone who is a believer in death. But there really isn't any teaching in the, in the New Testament that Jesus personally comes for us when we die. If we look at Luke chapter 16, and what I believe is a true story of the rich man and Lazarus, when Lazarus died, angels came to get him, so it's possible that when we die as Christians, angels come to get us. But what these verses are talking about is Jesus promised to go away and in heaven prepare a place for us believers, us disciples, who are alive and come to get us when we are alive at the rapture. This is a, pre a prediction and a promise of the rapture so that we can live together with him. Now follow Jesus' logic with me very carefully here. Jesus promised to prepare these dwelling places for us in heaven, right? Then he promises to come back and get us so that we will be with him in heaven in those places. So think with me, a pre-tribulation rapture, if Jesus comes prior to that seven years, that gives us seven years in heaven with Jesus to be in those wonderful dwelling places with Him. So I would challenge whatever view of the rapture you hold, there needs to be enough time in heaven with Jesus for these verses to come true. Now, and of course, a pre-tribulation pre rapture gives us that time in heaven with Jesus for these words to come literally fulfilled. 
The Apostle Paul was the one that God gave the honor to give the major revelation about the rapture. Let's look at the first of the two places where Paul describes this great event. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. Paul says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who are asleep, that is, Christians who are dead, so that you will not grieve like the rest, like unbelievers who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way God will bring with Him, with Jesus, those who have fallen asleep, those who have died through Jesus. For we say this to you by a revelation from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep, over Christians who have died. For the Lord Jesus Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. What a dramatic statement. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then what a wonderful phrase. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Every one of us gets down from time to time, discouraged. Go back and reread these verses when you get discouraged because I think they can encourage you every single time. This great passage teaches us several things about the rapture. First, the rapture is God's revelation. Notice here, by a revelation from the Lord. There is theological gossip out there in books and on the net that some 19th century brethren Christians invented the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture. That is false. God himself is the one who invented the rapture. It's his revelation to Paul and us. And as to whether the rapture occurs before the tribulation or not, that must be decided from Scripture. The second thing that this great passage tells us about the rapture is it guarantees that all Christians who've ever died will be resurrected. Because Jesus died and rose again, Christians who have believed in Him will not be held by death's cadaverous claws, but be released from death in the resurrection. What a comfort. I think everyone that's sitting out here at some time in your life has lost someone you loved in death. If that person is a believer, you will see them again at the rapture, at that resurrection. And by the way, these verses do not teach what is called soul sleep. You notice Paul uses this word asleep several times in this passage. Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, many Orthodox Jews, and even a few Christians think that this word sleep or asleep means that between the death, death and resurrection that a Christian is either unconscious or non-existent. The Bible doesn't teach that. It is our body that is symbolically laid to rest in the grave, and sleep is a beautiful picture that our body is awaiting the resurrection when it gets up out of the grave. But when we Christians die, our minds, our consciousness, our personality, our spirit is very much alive, awake, aware, and conscious probably more than we have ever been in our lives in the presence of Christ in heaven. And sadly, an unbeliever at the moment of death is awake, aware, and conscious in a place of torment, separated from God. Verse 14, notice, says, God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep, that is, those Christians. So it's very clear to me that Christians who have gone to heaven and are awaiting this great event of the rapture, they will come back with Jesus, fully aware, fully awake, awaiting their resurrection bodies along with ours. One more thing that this passage tells us. The rapture is God's wonderful promise that someday a whole generation of living Christians 
will escape death. Imagine being one of the select few by God's grace of all believers who have ever lived to never die. You know, death's not a pleasant thing. I don't look forward to it. Sometimes death is painful. Sometimes it's worse. But as a Christian, whatever death is for us, we know Jesus, probably His angels are waiting just the other side for us. But to be that generation of Christians that will never have to experience death, what a miracle, what a marvelous thing. Look at verse 17, this word caught up. In Greek, it means to snatch to seize or carry away. That's what was used of thieves stealing, snatching, purse snatchers. Uh, But in this case, it's Jesus snatching us up from this earth. And that's, of course, one description that Hal Lindsey and others have used of the rapture. They call it the great snatch up. And so what a marvelous thing that that will happen. And by the way, again, the Latin Vulgate uses the verb rapio, which means snatch or seize. And that's where we get our English word rapture from the Latin, rapio, or to be snatched up. Now, Paul gives us more information about the rapture in the third and last passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 51. Let's look at that, rather, chapter 15, sorry, beginning in verse 51. Paul says, listen, I am telling you a mystery, a mystery, something not revealed in the Old Testament, but revealed in the New He says, we will not all fall asleep, that is, we will not all die as Christians, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. Notice these words, all, we will not all fall asleep or die, but we will all be changed This refutes a partial rapture. Partial rapture says only part of Christians will go. What does Paul say? All, all will be changed. All will be snatched up. So the partial rapture position is false. Continuing on, verse 53, Paul says, For this corruptible must be clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal must be clothed with immortality. Whether we've died or whether we're uh, uh, alive at the time of the rapture, we will have a body then that's incorruptible, that is immortal. Verse 54, when this corruptible is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written in the Old Testament will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. What a great, victorious statement. Death, where is your victory? There's a taunt here. Death, where is your sting? And Paul then explains, now the sting of death is sin. We die because we're sinners. And the power of sin is the law. The law tells us that we're sinners. But by God's grace, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. A couple of more things that this great passage teaches us. First, the rapture will be instantaneous. In verse 52, look how fast it is. In a moment. This is the Greek word atomos, from which we get our English word atom. Faster than a second, it will be instantaneous. And in the blink, that's a translation in the Holman, but the Greek is a glance of an eye. A glance is really faster than a blink. So this is a transformation that will take place instantaneously. And then verse 57, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The rapture is a stupendous miracle, a double miracle, to rip all Christians who've died out of death's grasp, to take all of us living and transform us without ever having to die. When has there ever been a miracle in history like that one? obviously the resurrection of Jesus, but this is something that is going to be so amazing and so incredible. But it is sad how many professing Christians know nothing of the rapture, or they neglect its study, or they're misinformed about it. Boy, I feel sorry for them because they're missing out on one of the most encouraging truths of Scripture. Now, both of these passages we've looked at, 1 Thessalonians 
4 and 1 Corinthians 15 give us another reason for believing in a pre-tribulation rapture. Once again, let me ask you to follow the logic. Let's look at these verses. Notice in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul keeps saying, we, we who are alive, we who are alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, but we will all be changed. We will be changed. Why does Paul keep saying we? Because Paul fully expected to be alive when the Lord Jesus Christ returned to translate living believers to heaven. This is an important clue to tell us or to help us determine the time of the rapture. When we return to our study in Revelation, chapter 6 to 19 of Revelation, describe that future seven years when most of the world's population will be killed from war, plagues, or disasters. At that same time, those same seven years, millions of Christians will die as martyrs for their faith. Now, if Paul believed that he personally had to live through part or all of the tribulation when most people die, how could Paul write with such confidence that he would be alive when the Lord returns? The only way Paul could know that he would be alive at the rapture was if he believed the rapture would occur before the tribulation when all those people die. And so we who believe in a pre-trib rapture can have the same confidence that Paul did, that we will be alive to personally experience Jesus' return before the start of those seven terrible years. Now, because the rapture is such an extraordinary event, it's natural for us to be curious about it. What will it be like to lift off into the sky, to be transformed from an ugly bug into a beautiful butterfly, and to never die? Well, it just so happens that two men in the Old Testament actually experienced a rapture. They went straight to heaven without dying, so their experience gives us a few clues about what the rapture will be like for us. Let's look at those. The first man in the Bible to be raptured, taken to heaven without dying, was Enoch. Let's look at him, Genesis 5, verse 21. Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. And after the birth of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years. Man, every phrase here we could spend a sermon on. And he fathered other sons and daughters. So Enoch's life lasted 365 years. Enoch walked with God. Then he was not there because God took him. Now, if you just read those verses in the Old Testament, you might think that God took Enoch in death. But the New Testament helps us out by explaining what really happened. Hebrews 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that what? He did not experience death. And then it quotes Genesis. And he was not found because God took him away. For prior to Enoch's removal, (laughs) he was approved since he had pleased God. How did he please God? Now, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For the one who draws near to Him must believe that He exists and rewards those who seek Him. I have used, I know I've said it here before, but it's worth saying again. Verse 6 here, I have shared with so many non-Christians over the years that if you will just seek God, just reach out to try to find Him, Draw near to Him. Believe that He exists. He will reward you by allowing you to find Him. Now, of course, we Christians know from the New Testament that no one seeks God without God drawing them. But just look at it from our side. This is a wonderful promise that if you will just seek God, believe that He's there, He will reward that little faith by giving you greater faith to trust in Him. It's interesting that after this, that right before this greatest verse in the Bible on faith, what had happened? Enoch was raptured out of this world without dying. Enoch was a man of faith. So I think that believing in the rapture and waiting for the Lord to return is one of the greatest faith builders in our lives. 
Do you want to have your faith grow as a Christian? Then study the rapture. And this, next week, I'm going to show you a whole lot of verses about the Lord's return. So uh, it's a great thing to help our faith and confidence in the Lord. And of course, God rewarded Enoch's faith not only by taking him to heaven, but by allowing Enoch to be the first prophet in the Bible to ever predict the second coming of Christ to earth with us Christians. Let's look at that, Jude 14, written by Jesus' half-brother, Judas, or Jude. Verse 14, And Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied about them, that is about apostates, those who have turned away from the faith. Look, the Lord, meaning the Lord Jesus, comes with thousands of His holy ones. That is a prediction of the second coming to earth when we will return with Him. And, of course, the purpose of that, Jude says, is to execute judgment on all and to convict them of all their ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against Him. Jude didn't mince any words. So you see that he really was a good student of his half-brother, Jesus. Now, before we say goodbye to Enoch... I think that his rapture to heaven, if we can say that, is another good reason for believing in a pre-tribulation rapture. Let me show you why. Luke chapter 17, verse 26, Jesus said, just as it was in the days of Noah, and Enoch lived in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man, that is before the second coming of Christ. People went on eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage into the day Noah boarded the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Stay with me here. Jesus said that the days before the flood is a picture of what it's going to be like before Christ's second coming to earth. Now, Noah and his family entered the ark before the flood. And the New Testament tells us that's a picture of Israel being protected during the tribulation period. Uh, by the God, and we'll actually get to that in Revelation chapter 7 and 14 later when that's talked about. But when was Enoch raptured? When was he taken out of this world? Long before the flood, long before Noah ever went into the ark. Into the ark. So I think that Enoch's rapture is a good picture of a pre-tribulation rapture that happens many, many years before the judgment falls. The other guy in the Old Testament who was taken out of this world without dying was Elijah. Let's look at him quickly. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. As they, speaking of Elijah, the older prophet, and Elisha, his disciple, continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire with horses of fire suddenly appeared and separated the two of them. I think if that chariot had not driven between them that Elijah would have grabbed on to Elijah's coattails and wanted to go up with him. Then Elijah went up into heaven in the whirlwind. It's often, you've seen illustrations that uh, Elijah is riding the chariot. Nope. The chariot just separates Elisha and Elijah. Elijah goes up in the tornado. So Dorothy Gale of Kansas was not the first person to ever ride in a tornado. Elijah was. <laughs> And he went straight to heaven. And as Elisha watched, he kept crying out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. Then he never saw Elijah again. But of course, Elijah appears in the New Testament on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Jesus and Peter, James, and John see him. Now, if you read the verses that follow this amazing story, the sons of the prophets who were like seminary students... They went and looked for Elijah, but they never found him. And that gives me another clue about what the rapture in the future is going to be like for us. I believe that the rapture will be a public event and that we Christians will be missed and searched for by people left behind. I disagree with the old brethren view of a secret rapture. Let's go back again and look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord Himself, the Lord Jesus, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. That sounds to me like a very public event. 
Now, I, I agree that we just said that the rapture for us is instantaneous. We're changed uh, faster than you can blink your eye. But if you look at Elijah's departure, where they looked for him and couldn't find him, later when we read Revelation, I'll point out some places where I think that this is the case, especially chapter 6. I think that people will see that things are happening at the rapture. Cars suddenly unmanned, planes suddenly without pilots, people that were there in a restaurant that are no longer there. They won't see the transformation, but they'll see the empty chair. They'll see the empty house, the empty car. So they will miss us. They will look for us. And I think that there will be some, by the grace of God, that will read the Bible. And of course, the Bible will be left behind at the rapture. And they will realize what has occurred and that many of them will come to faith in Christ too late for the rapture, but not too late to be sure of heaven when they're called upon to die as martyrs. So I would say thank you to our post-tribulation uh, brothers who have pointed out that a secret rapture is really not in Scripture. But I would disagree with them that the rapture is at the end of the tribulation that is part of Christ's very, very public second coming to this earth. Now, the question is, how will the world explain away a public rapture of millions of Christians? I'm sure it will be a great cover-up like kidnapped by flying saucers, beamed up by aliens. And so what's the conclusion? The world needs to unite against extraterrestrial invaders. Now, you laugh, but hey, maybe there'll be another explanation. But if the government... The scientific community and the news media all tell somebody it's true, a lot of poor souls will believe it. And as we will read in the book of Revelation in our study in a few weeks, there will be no atheists on earth during the tribulation. Now, a few weeks ago, when we studied Revelation 2 to 3, I gave you another good reason for believing in a pre tribulation rapture. I would like to review that. Let's look at that in, in Revelation 3, verse 10. Jesus says, Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come over the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Now, Jesus' promise here, as I pointed out, was not just to the Philadelphia church, but to all Christians. Jesus said that he would keep them from or out of, great preposition, ek, that future seven years of tribulation. Jesus could have said, I will keep you in the hour of testing, or I will keep you through the hour of testing. Those would be consistent with a mid-tribulation rapture, a post-tribulation rapture. But what did Jesus say? I will keep you from, I will keep you out of that hour of testing. And that is consistent with a pre-trib rapture. Paul makes the same point. Let's look at one more verse. 1 Thessalonians 1, <clears throat> verse 10. And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who rescues us from, same preposition, the wrath to come. New American Standard is what I'm quoting from. Now, let's don't talk about post-trib a minute. Let's talk about mid-trib. Our brothers who hold to a mid-tribulation rapture believe that we Christians will have to live through the first three and a half years, but not the second three and a half years when the bold judgment, this, these supreme examples of wrath are poured out on the earth. That's Revelation 16. However, when we study Revelation 6, God pours His wrath out early in the seven years. Let's look at that passage. We'll look at it in detail in February. Revelation 6, 12. Then I saw, John says, him, the lamb, open or break the sixth seal. A violent earthquake occurred. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The entire moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs when shaken by a high wind. The sky separated like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the nobles, the military commanders, the rich, the powerful, and every slave and free person hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us 
from the face of the one seated on the throne, God the Father, and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come. Who is able to stand? So the wrath of God falls early in that seven years of tribulation. So for us to be protected from that wrath to come, then we can't be here to experience any of the tribulation. So that is a marvelous, marvelous promise. Not because we deserve it, but because God has simply promised it. Now, I could give you other reasons, but I've saved what I think is the best and strongest argument for a pre-tribulation rapture for next week. And that is that Christ could come at any moment. And there's so many verses to deal with, I'm going to devote the entire sermon next week to that topic of the imminent return of Christ. And as a bonus next Sunday, I plan to give you, and this is not a joke, a five-minute crash course in how we do theology. Have you ever wondered how the church has come up with these various doctrines that we believe? I'm going to give you a five-minute crash course in how we do that next Sunday. So please come back. I've done a lot of work on that message, and it's one of those very, very important ones, not just to argue and I think hopefully convince you why the, the, the rapture will be pre-tribulation, but uh, to show how we do theology. So please be here. M.R. Dehan was a Christian medical doctor. <clears throat> he was also known as a Bible teacher and founder of a great ministry called the Radio Bible Class. <clears throat> and they have a little booklet that they put out for a generation that I know has encouraged many Christians. But Dr. Dehan always had a sign on his desk when he was a doctor, later when he was a Bible teacher. And on that sign were engraved two words, perhaps today. Dehan kept that sign as a reminder that he could keep seeing of how we should live each day, expecting Christ to return at any moment. Are you ready for the rapture? What if Jesus came back today? There's only two of us here that this can apply to. Friend, are you ready for Jesus to take you to heaven? You can be ready by trusting in Jesus' perfect sacrifice on the cross to forgive your sins and make you right with God so that you can stand in heaven in those great dwelling places before a holy God. Christian brother or sister, are you living each day so that you would not be ashamed for Jesus to return and find you doing anything that is out of God's will. You know, there's no day like today to start getting ready for Jesus to come back. When will that be? Perhaps today. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this message will be an encouragement, a challenge, uh, not just here, but to all those who hear it, to all those who watch it. And I pray that I and that my brothers and sisters here would be ready. I pray, Lord, that we would impress upon those we witness to the need to be right with God because we don't know when the Lord's coming back. And it is an urgent time for those who don't believe. So I pray that we would be faithful to witness. And so, Lord, I ask these things in the glorious and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you.